We are Life Church Livonia. All right, Life Church Livonia. Good morning. You guys are energetic today. I like it. I like it. My name is Brian. I am the pastor here, and I love uh, the chance I get to every week to come and be with you. Uh, we are becoming family with one another. If you are new here to get, uh, today, we would love to get to know you. And so uh, make sure to introduce yourself before we go. Uh, we just want to make sure that you feel uh, really well welcomed and loved here. And, uh, and we're in the middle of a series, brand new series that I'm so excited about. And what this series is all about is eight weeks of inviting you to not just come to church on a Sunday morning and hear about God, uh, not just to come and hear about God's Word, but to engage God's Word yourself. And so each week we're uh, uh, going to be wa- teaching through a passage of Scripture that we're then inviting you to read uh, during that, na- that next week. And so there's a table out in the lobby, you'll notice it has books on it. And uh, the name of this series is Beginnings. And really, uh, it comes from a series of books called Immerse, which is just the Bible broken up into smaller chunks and, uh, and in a, a way that's a little bit more readable. It got rid of all the verses, all the chapter headings, uh, and just, just just gave you the text of the Bible to read. And so over the, the course of eight weeks, we're going to read the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so as we do that, um, we're going to preach, it, uh, pe- preach through it. So as I said last week, I can't preach every single verse in the second half of Genesis that we're covering today. And so I'm not even going to try. But what I hope to do is allow you to, to see that the Bible is not what you thought it was. And so for many of us uh, who are unfamiliar, who've never read the Old Testament especially, um, we have this idea about what it is that really it isn't. And as we dive in and we read, it kind of shatters some of those presuppositions we have about the text. And so let me help you understand a little bit about what the Bible isn't. It's not neat and tidy. The stories in, in the Bible are not uh, this really simple, clean stories. In fact, the, the book of Genesis is probably rated R. If it was going to be a movie, it would be at least rated R. And maybe in, in certain segments, unless they did some clever editing, would be more than rated R. And so uh, it's not neat and tidy. The heroes that, that are portrayed in the stories are all a total hot mess. And so just like us, friends, they're just like us. The culture that you're going to encounter as you read the, the text is completely different than our own and very different than from anything you've ever experienced or will ever experience because most of it is set in ancient Mesopotamia. It's a, it was a long time ago with a group of people that are totally different than, than you or I. So you can't overlay your culture onto the Bible and expect it to look uh, like ours. You can't expect them to act like we act. And, and last week, as we talked about this, um, is that ultimately the Bible is an, is an epic tale of God's ongoing quest to redeem his creation. We're a part of that. His ongoing quest to redeem his creation and to allow all of humanity to know his grace, his truth, and his love. This is the story that we're reading about. And so as we talk about epic tales, uh, think about what kind of tales you would tell if someone came to you and asked you to tell the story of your people, the story of your culture? Uh, what kind of stories do you think you would pick? Well, clearly, you would pick amazing stories, stories of success, of fame, of innovation, of genius. Uh, you, would, you would probably want to focus on people who upheld the ideal image of not only who you are, but who you wish you were. Uh, we see this all the time. If it, gets, uh, if it gets skewed too far by a culture or by a country, we call it propaganda, right? Where they're, where they're painting a picture of what they want everyone to believe they are, putting a, kind of a, a mask on the truth, and only telling the stories that portray that image, that idea that is super far from reality. And so sometimes when we read those stories, uh, they, they, they bring a, something to life in us because we long to be like that. But we also can't see ourselves in those stories because none of us are like that. Our lives aren't perfect, right? Our lives are messy. We do make mistakes. We are people that have faults. So we, we actually, when we, when we get into to God's word, we begin to see that there's something different going on here. 
Something completely uh, unlike what most cultures would choose when they tell their epic tales. Tim Keller says it really well. He says, the purpose of most cultures' epics are to show us heroic figures, to show us the, the ideal human. The purpose of the biblical stories aren't so much to show us how to lead heroic lives or perfect lives or ideal lives. Instead, the biblical stories show us how to meet God, whose grace we need to live a new life. They, they show us how God comes down into the lives of people who don't look for his grace or deserve his grace, but receive God's grace anyway. This is why the Bible is such an epic tale, because it's not really a story about those people at all. It's not really a story about those heroes. It's a story about God and God's pursuit of you and God's pursuit of me and God's pursuit of those people in that really broken culture that makes no sense to us so much of the time. And so this week, as we jump into the the second half of Genesis, it's, it's, it's dozens of chapters as, as we dive into this, this huge story, it has a, a story arc that covers uh, hundreds of years. We're going to focus and laser in on one man. His name is Jacob. And in a lot of ways, it makes sense that Genesis uses, uh, the second half of Genesis spends a lot of time in this guy's story. Because he's the kind of person that, that honestly, um, other people might have chosen for their poster boy. You know how at the, like when the Olympics come, uh, they always highlight people that are success stories, the people that, against all odds, they survived and they overcame, and now they're this perfect you know, diver or they're, they're the fastest runner. And they love to st- tell these human interest stories. Well, in some ways, Jacob's story is, is kind of one that we might celebrate in our American culture. He was the second-born son of a patriarch who should have been kind of a nobody, the invisible child. The one that didn't matter. The one that would have had to have fought for every single thing he ever got. And, and, and despite his birth order, because birth order in, in that time, in that place, was everything. Despite his birth order, he, he developed this, this knack to, to, to grow business and to become wealthy and to make a name for himself. He, he achieved success against all odds. He became a very wealthy man. And yet, despite that apparent success, despite the outward appearance of having really uh, just, he's killing it at life. Despite all of that, he was kind of sleazy. He really was. He lied, he deceived, he schemed his way to the top at the expense of relationships all along the way. Jacob was a man who wanted to be valued. He wanted to be seen. He wanted to win. Jacob wanted to live a blessed life under his terms and on his conditions, and he was willing to do anything it took to get those blessings, anything at all. So in order to understand him, you have to, and especially in order to understand the story that we're going to focus in on today, you have to know a little bit about his backstory. Uh, Isaac, his dad, was a son of, of Abraham, and, and Abraham is really where it all began uh, for the, the people of Israel. And, and so Isaac, he marries Rebekah. Rebekah gets pregnant with twins, which is already hard enough, but, but the Bible tells us that, that this wasn't just a normal pregnancy, that her twins were fighting in utero. Imagine being that mom. What an awful thing. Your belly is already larger because you're carrying twins, and now they're fighting inside of you. That does not bode well for their toddler years, right? And so it says in Genesis 25, 22, but the two children struggled with each other in her womb. This is not good. And so uh, they, they're, they're born. Esau is born first, which is a really big deal. And as Esau is, is being born, his brother Jacob comes out holding on to his heel. This is crazy. They were fighting as they came out of the womb during childbirth. And so what do they name Jacob? They, they, what do they name him? Jacob, which means heel grabber. <laughs> what if your name was heel grabber? What an awful name. It really designated that he was second place. Heel grabber. His very name reminded him that he was insignificant. 
that he was the grasper, the struggler, the one that was trying to be first and wasn't. So we flash forward in their story and we see Jacob scheming. He wants to be first place and so he trades uh, his brother uh, the first place birthright for a bowl of stew. We could spend the whole day just talking about what in the world Esau was thinking to trade his brother away his birthright to be the firstborn son. But it works. He schemes his way. He, he, he does this incredible like moment of acting to get his, his dad to bless him because his dad was blind and couldn't see. And all this crazy stuff happens. And long story short is he steals the blessing that was for his older brother Esau. He steals it from him. And when Esau realizes what's happened, Esau is furious. And he was kind of a man's man, a hunter and a fisherman, and strong and brave, and he wanted to end Jacob. He was so mad. He wanted to end his life. And so Rebecca, Jacob's mom, was like, you need to leave because your brother is going to kill you. And so she comes up with a scheme. She's going to send Jacob off to live with her brother Laban. And hopefully he will go away, leave home, and find a wife and a life. Isn't that every mom's dream for their sons? Will you please just leave the home and find a wife and a life, right? So that I don't have to deal with your issues. Your brother and you fighting are still fighting. You are growing adults. Go find a wife and a life, right? So he leaves all by himself. He fought to steal this blessing from his brother, and then he didn't even get to live into that blessing. Isn't that interesting? He had to leave home. He left home, and he, and he journeys to where Laban lived with his whole family, and um, everything happens the way his mom would hope it would. Uh, he finds uh, this new family. He uh, gets married. He has uh, multiple wives, actually, because their culture was totally different than ours. And, and he schemes his way into success as a shepherd and a businessman and as a father. And he grows this huge family and grows really wealthy. And he ends up with all this money and all, this she- all these sheep and all these goats and all these children and a ton of dysfunction. Like dysfunction on top of dysfunction on top of dysfunction. And now, uh, he has a new family, but now his new family isn't happy with him. His father-in-law is upset because much of his success came at his father-in-law's expense. And so after at least 14 years, probably closer to 20 years, living away from home, building this brand new family, God appears to to Jacob. It's really interesting. This is what it says in Genesis 31.3. It says, then the Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relatives there, and I will be with you. What? Like, I, you're asking me to go to a place that even in the way you speak about it isn't my home. It's not return to your land. It's return to the land of your father and your grandfather and to your relatives there, and I'll be with you. J- Jacob's like, this is my home now. This is where my wives are. This is where my family is. This is where all of my flocks and my herds are. And God's saying, return to the land of your father and your grandfather. And guess what? If you do that, I will be with you. God was asking him to do something that was really a big deal. To uproot everyone. It wasn't just him that was going to go home. It was going to be everyone. We're talking about a caravan of servants and, and workers and children and animals It was a big deal. And you didn't just go move to a new subdivision and buy a new home. You packed your home up and carried it with you. And God's like, I want you to go back to the place where I planted your family. Back to the place, by the way, where your older brother still lives. The older brother that wanted to kill you. And now the the God of, of Jacob's father and his grandfather is asking him to trust him to follow him, to to submit to him. And the the crazy thing about the story is that Jacob agrees to do it. Now, I don't know what his full motives were, but I think part of his motives here, um, part of it was a mixed motive of, I I, want to do what God says for me to do, uh, but I also want to get away from my father-in-law because he really doesn't like me. So now he's running from another relationship back to a different dysfunctional relationship uh, that that, that he's kind of stuck between. Stuck between Esau and Laban. But regardless, he chooses to do it. He chooses to obey God. And we see, even in his obedience to God, we see his scheming. We see his dysfunction. We see that he has ulterior motives to his obedience with God. I think a lot of us do this sometimes. 
We say yes to a portion of what God asks us to do because it suits our plans and our desires and our dreams. We're not doing it simply to please God. We're doing it because we want something out of it. And I think in this case, he wants to get away from a bad situation, a bad situation that he himself had created. One interesting thing to note here is that up until this point, not only does, does God refer to the land being that of his father and his grandfather, but even God himself is, made, uh, is not referenced as Jacob's God. Never once does it say that this is Jacob's God. In fact, when he leaves home the first time and travels to, to, to meet, be with Laban, this is what it says in Genesis 28. He has a dream, and God appears to him in that dream, and this is what it says. I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather, Abraham, and the God of your father, Isaac. This is an introduction. This is God appearing to Jacob in a dream and being like, hey, how's it going? I'm God. Your, your grandfather knew me, your dad knew me, I did incredible things in their life, and I'd like to introduce myself to you. This is how important it is that, that Jacob has no clue. Jacob has no idea. And then during his return trip home, now he's, he's trying to go back home where Esau's living. Laban is pursuing him because he snuck away in the middle of the night because he didn't want to actually have a face-to-face conversation with Laban. And he's on the way home and Laban chases after him. And when he captures him, he says, what are you doing? Why are you leaving the way you left? And by the way, someone stole from me when you left. I want to search all of your camp and figure out who stole from me. And then, and then this is what Jacob says. He says, if the God of my father had not been on my side, the God of Abraham and the fearsome God of Isaac, you would have sent me away empty-handed. Laban's like, why did you leave? He's like, because you would have robbed me. And the only reason that I left with everything I left is because the God of who? Of my father was on my side. The God of my grandfather and the fearsome God of Isaac. And both his, his initial trip to, to, to meet Laban and now his return trip back to Esau, both times we have perfect examples of Jacob not having any type of relationship with God himself. God introduces himself as the father, as the God of his father and his grandfather, and, and Jacob refers to God as the God of his father and his grandfather. Jacob didn't have a personal relationship with God. He knew who God was, but he didn't know God personally. His life, his success, his blessings, all of it had come to him because he was the heel grabber, the wrestler, the grappler, the underdog schemer who refused to submit to second place. He wanted to win at all costs. And now that God that he really didn't know, that God that he really didn't have a relationship with, with was asking him to return home and to submit to his plans for his life. And he says, Jacob, if you do this, I will be with you. And I'm not convinced that Jacob really cared if God was with him as long as God blessed him. As long as he got what he wanted from God. So he deals with Laban. And, La- and honestly, part of the way he dealt with Laban was through deceit once again. And Laban goes home and he continues his journey to go and meet up with Esau and he starts to stress out in a big way. Imagine how stressful this would have been. Oh, by the way, I'm back. The scheming second-born son who ran away. I'm back. Don't kill me. (laughs) And so he starts to stress. He's like, my brother is going to kill me. And he begins a scheme and a plan to figure out a way that he can actually make this uh, twist it into his favor. And so the first thing he does is he sends messengers ahead. He said, I want you to run ahead in front of the caravan. Go and find my brother Esau. And this is what I want you to tell him. Tell him that, hey, Jacob's coming home and he's super rich. That was the message. How arrogant is that? This is a guy that really cared deeply about how other people saw him, viewed him, perceived him. He had an image to uphold. Everything he did, he put into uh, showing that he was valuable, that he was worth something, that he was a success, that he wasn't simply the second-born son. And even the way he introduces himself back to his brother says, look at me, I made something of myself. I'm valuable. I'm worthwhile. I don't need anything from you. I'm not coming home to steal your stuff. I got plenty of my own stuff. Check me out. 
So Jacob, they're still journeying towards home, and now the messengers come back. And can you imagine him? He's waiting. He's like, what did he say? Did you find Esau? What did he, what did he say? And they're like, yeah, we found, we found Esau. We told him your message. And by the way, he's on his way here with 400 warriors. This is not what he wanted to hear at all. Because everything he was afraid would happen, it appears as if it's about to happen. This would have been terrifying. Oh, yeah, your brother that wanted to kill you before, now he's not coming by himself. He's coming with an army. An army that there's no way you could match personally. You're going to die. That's what it appeared like, right? Yes. So he starts planning again. He's like, well, what can I do? Okay, my brother's on his way, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make little groups of my servants go ahead, and I'm going to send them ahead to meet the 400 warriors and my brother, and I'm going to send them with a bunch of gifts. It's going to be all these sheep and all these goats and all these camels and everything that, that I think my brother might value. And so all of this blessing that he'd carved up for himself, he's giving it away now. He doesn't even get to actually experience the blessing that he'd achieved. And he's going to give away all these sub, the, the gift after gift. His brother's going to be like journeying down the trail. And here comes a group of people with a bunch of sheep and goats. And oh, by the way, these are for you, Esau. And then he's going to go another mile or two down the path. And here's another group of people with a bunch of sheep and goats and camels. They're going to say, oh, these are for you, Esau. They're from your brother Jacob. They're peace offerings to you. I think in a lot of ways, uh, Jacob never wanted his brother to actually make it to him. He was hoping that he could bribe his way to reconciliation without ever having to have a face-to-face encounter with his brother. He gets so desperate, he even starts praying. This is not something he had ever done before. We don't see him praying anywhere else in the, in the story up until this moment. In Genesis 32, 9, it says, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my grandfather Abraham and God of my father Isaac. This seems so unfamiliar, right? God of my grandfather, and God of my father, Isaac. Oh, Lord, you told me, return to your own land and to your relatives. And this is almost an accusatory prayer of saying, uh, hey, God that I don't know, but my grandfather did. You're the one that got me into this mess. You're the one that told me to do this. What am I going to do? I'm desperate now. I'm desperate now. This is a really messed up situation. But still, he's praying to a God that is not his own. But then something amazing happens. Just a night, one night later, something incredible happens shortly after this prayer that I think if we pay attention to, it it could give us, you and I, pointers on what we should do when we get to a spot where we desperately need something to change. When we get to a spot in our life where we realize that all of our efforts to create our own value, our own worth, our own way in life uh, have all turned to shambles, where it's all falling apart. When we get to a spot in our life where we are desperate for a change, what should we do? Watch what Jacob does. And some of it is messed up, honestly. We see his brokenness even in this, in this transformational story, but some of it is so beautiful and points us in the direction that we need to go ourselves. I'm just going to read the whole story to you. Genesis 32, starting in verse 22. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. And after taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. And this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. There he is going after his blessing again. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel. Because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. And then he blessed Jacob there. We could spend weeks on this story. There's so many parts of this that, that, that make us ask questions and, and uh, leave us wondering what really went on there. But I don't want us to miss the point of story by getting stuck in the details because what we know is that Jacob's life was never the same after this encounter. So what really happened here? 
How does it apply to us? Because what we see happen here is that Jacob met God face to face and actually recognized him for the first time. Jacob met God and was transformed by him for the first time. He'd had other God encounters, like brief God encounter, where God spoke to him, where God called him to do something, or when God introduced himself to him. But Jacob had never responded. He just continued to do his own thing. And for the very first time, Jacob's life is transformed by a personal encounter with God. Some of you in this room have never had a personally transforming relationship with God. You're like Jacob. You've been either uh, holding God at arm's length, never even attempting to have a relationship with him personally, or you've been living vicariously through the relationship that other people have with God. You may know you're that person if your faith is very dependent upon your circumstances. If your faith is dependent upon where you're going to church or who you're hanging out with, then it may be that you've never had a personally transforming relationship with God yourself. You've never had a face-to-face encounter with God. This was Jacob. But everything changed here. And I think in the same way that everything changed for Jacob here, everything could change for you here. So what did he do? What did he do that we can replicate And the first thing he did that he got right in this story is that he got alone with God. Jacob did everything in his power to avoid face-to-face encounters with people that he didn't know or the people that he didn't get along with or people that he needed to reconcile with. When things were broken with Esau, what did he do? He left. He didn't want to have a face-to-face encounter. He didn't want to be alone with Esau. Why did he not want to be alone with Esau? Because he was afraid that Esau would kill him, and he was probably right. So he leaves, and then he has issues with Laban. And instead of having a face-to-face encounter with Laban that would then allow them to reconcile, he flees, and Laban has to pursue him because he doesn't want to have a face-to-face meeting and get alone with Laban. And then here's the problem is that reconciliation with anyone, whether it be Esau or Laban or God, can never happen until you get face-to-face with people. Until you have an encounter with them. And Jacob finally has an opportunity to get face-to-face with God because he got alone with God. Until Jacob stops running and until we stop running, we will never have an opportunity to be transformed by God. Until we send everyone and everything away and face the God who never stops pursuing us, never stops loving us, never stops uh, going after relationship with us, we will never be reconciled with God. And we'll never find the type of blessing that actually makes sense type of blessing that actually is what we didn't even know we knew, we didn't even know we needed. Jacob was going after his own blessing. God wanted to bless him his way. But most of us are stubborn like Jacob. Most of us are unwilling to do this the way that Jacob did it. We wait until we're at the end of our rope. We wait until we're absolutely desperate. We wait until every other option has been uh, pursued, explored, and has come to a dead end until we get to the spot where we're like, okay, God, I have nowhere else to turn. And we're finally willing to get alone with God. And when he did, what did he do? He wrestled with God. If you want to learn how to wrestle in real life, talk to Coach Rod. I think he's here, right? Right? He knows how to wrestle. Legendary Catholic Central wrestling coach. He'll teach you how to throw someone to the ground. But this is Jacob teaching us how to wrestle with God. Totally different. None of Coach Coach Rod's moves would work against God. I'm sorry, Coach Rod. Where are you at? Your moves don't work against God. They just don't. The greatest wrestler in the world. But it says that Jacob wrestled with God all night long. Jacob refused to give up. All of his scheming, all of his his typical moves, all of his typical grappling, none of it works. He was the guy that refused to come in second place. But I'm convinced that he was fighting for first place, but he was fighting for the wrong thing. When you wrestle with God, you ha- it's critical that you do so. You bring your struggles, you bring your fears, you bring your frustrations, you bring your doubts, you bring all of your, your, your stuff with you, and you need to wrestle it out with God. But when you do so, it cannot be about winning. It has to be about meeting God. It has to be about the encounter. It has to be about a desire to be transformed through the encounter. 
Listen to what it says. A man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, it doesn't say that he couldn't win the match. It was God. It says that he would not win the match. Have you ever been in an argument with someone and you knew you were right? Imagine that you're the expert on something. You've studied. You've done all the searches on the web. You've set in all the classes. You have all the certifications. And you're in a conversation or an argument with someone, and you're wrestling verbally with them. And it comes to a spot where it's been hours of conversation. You realize this person is not going to give up. Like that, the person even knows they're wrong, but they're unwilling to admit that they're wrong because they would lose face, right? So what do you do? You're like, you know what? I'm not going to convince you. I can see I'm not going to win this, so I'm just going to what? Walk away. All night long, Jacob refusing to submit, refusing to let anyone but himself win, refusing to take second place, And it says, when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of socket. And then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. He could have done that in the first moment of the match. What happens? All night long, Jacob's refusing to submit. And finally, the man says, I can see that you're never going to submit to me. God wins. It's just like that. Talk about a a big old fat piece of humble pie. He's like, I'm, Jacob's thinking, I can do it. I've been going all night long. And God's like, boop, I win. Let me go now. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to walk away. The outcome of the match was never about strength. God could have won at any moment. The outcome of the match was totally dependent on whether or not Jacob was willing to submit or not submit. Whether Jacob was finally willing to be second place. Most scholars would argue that Jacob didn't actually know fully who it was he was wrestling with until the moment his hip fell out of socket. And that's why the man now says, you need to let me go because now Jacob doesn't want to let him go. He's like, no, 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 don't leave. Don't walk away. I just figured out who you were. And now, before you go, I demand that you bless me. What? He still doesn't get it. He's like, I demand that you give me this blessing, the kind of blessing that I don't even know what that means, God, but I see who you are and I see that you have power and I want you to bless me before you leave. What does the man say? I love this. He says, what's your name? Was it, that, was it that God didn't know Jacob's name? No, absolutely. He says, what's your name? It's that he wanted Jacob to admit his name. He says, my name is Jacob, the heel grabber, the deceiver, the schemer, the one who longs to be seen and will do anything it takes to prove to the world that I have value. My name is Jacob, the one that has been seeking out blessing at the expense of all the people around me, the one who will never give up and never take second place and never submit to anyone. My name is Jacob. And I believe that saying his name was a form of confession to admit who he had been. What a great question. If God were to look at you and say, what's your name, what would you say? What would sum up the essence of who you've been until this moment? And then Genesis 32, the man says, your name will no longer be Jacob. I love this. Your name will no longer be Jacob. You will no longer be defined by all those things for your past. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Wait a second. How did he win? He's the guy with the broken up hip. The guy that walks away like dragging his leg for the rest of his life. It does not look like the guy that won. So how did he win? What, what is going on here? Even after God had wrecked him, Jacob won because he finally had a relationship with God. 
He was this man who was willing to do anything to live a blessed life except submit. And now he had finally won by submitting to God and finding a different type of blessing, one that he had never even known he longed for. He won because now he was no longer going to be defined as Jacob, the heel grabber, the deceiver, the the second place guy. He was going to be defined by a new name, a new identity. He would be known as Israel. What does Israel mean? It means God prevails. God rules over all. God is sovereign. He was going to be marked and defined and identified as a man who came in second place. This was how he won. He won because now it's no longer just the God of Abraham and Isaac. It's now the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. A personal relationship with God. Friends, so many times we try to scheme our way or plan our way into happiness. uh, To fight our way to the top. And we get to the top and we can't even enjoy it anymore because we've left a trail behind us of broken relationships. We can't even enjoy the blessings that we fought for. We live our lives with with a really simple rule that that is no one will tell me what to do or have their thumb over me or be in control or power over me. I will determine my own destiny. And we carry that over into our relationship with God and we end up walking away with a limp and dissatisfied in our relationship with God because we really don't have a relationship with God. We have a laundry list of things we want God to do for us. I demand that you bless me. But I refuse to let you change me. I refuse to submit to you. And until we do, nothing will change. And we're so stubborn, so resistant. And what we want God to do is give us everything we've asked for and lovingly and soothingly comfort us and draw us into this relationship and give us the desires of our heart and everything we want and give him uh, uh, us, himself. But it doesn't work that way. That's not the God we find in this story. Sometimes God has to wrestle us into a transformed life rather than comfort us into a transformed life. It's true for so many of us that God has to wrestle us into transform life. We have to come to a place of brokenness first, even if it's God who has to break us because we refuse to submit. What if we chose to submit before he had to break us? Wouldn't that be a much better way? What if we chose to get alone with God and be transformed by God prior to being so desperate? I want to invite you into a process with God where God can transform you. I want to invite you into that space today. Choose to get alone with God. In a few moments, we're going to respond through singing and through worship. Take that moment to, to, you can't be alone physically, but you can close your eyes and get alone emotionally and spiritually. You can get alone with God in the quiet of your own heart. Choose to wrestle with God in that place. Bring all your frustrations, your fears, your brokenness. Confess who you are to God just like Jacob did. And after that confession, choose to submit. God, I choose to be second place to you. I choose to make you king, Lord of all. I want my name to be Israel. The Lord prevails. And when we do this, We're choosing to be transformed by God just the way that Jacob was. This could be our story. His story could be our story. And I want to invite you into that space. Would you pray with me? God, we just take a moment to pause to get alone with you as as best we can right here in this space. To change our position or our posture if we need to. To acknowledge your presence. To wrestle with you, God. To pour out everything right now, God. We pour it out. All the things we're 
frustrated about, we're worried about, we're terrified of, our, our feelings of insignificance, our desire for worth and value, our desire to be right over, uh, over everything else, God. The God, we confess the way that we've, we've, we've placed being right over, over good relationships. That we, God, we confess the brokenness that we've left behind us. Whatever it is, God, we, we just give it to you. All of our bad decisions, all of our hurtful attitudes, God, we give it all over to you. God, we choose to submit to you. Not my plan, God, not my will, but yours be done. I submit my life to you. Become king of my life, Lord of my life. Forgive me of all the ways I've done it on my own, God, and, and lead me in a new direction. Give me a new name today, Lord. Transform me into your image into the person you made me to be. I choose you today, God. I choose you over my stubbornness. I choose you over my sin. I choose you over my failure. Thank you. We worship you in this place. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.